NATO meeting again today. Can they do more to help Ukraine? And quickie divorces mean couples no longer have to play the blame game when separating. But does it make a mockery of marriage? We're also going to be talking fracking, hypersonic missiles and calories on menus. A banquet of news for the next hour. But what do you need to talk about? Email me gbviews at gbnews.uk or you can tweet us at gbnews. But first, it's time for the GB News headlines. Good afternoon. It's just coming up to two minutes past two. I'm Rosie Wright, here to get you up to date on GB News. The Prime Minister says that today's 1.25% rise in national insurance is unquestionably the right thing to do, not only for our country, but for the NHS. That rise, though, means Britain's tax burden has now risen to its highest point in 70 years, impacting the income of millions of workers. The government predicts £39 billion will be raised over the next three years. And Boris Johnson says people are going to have to make choices, but the government will do all it can to help. The most important thing is to have a strong, robust economy in which you have a high level of security in your employment, uh, in which people know that uh, there's a, there's a long-term plan uh, to deliver jobs and, and growth. The Chancellor's popularity with voters has declined as the cost of living continues to rise. It's a YouGov survey that found that Rishi Sunak's net favourability has dropped 24 points in the last fortnight since he made the spring statements. Well, earlier today, campaigners dressed up as the Chancellor outside the Treasury office in London, protesting the rise in national insurance. Boris Johnson says what's happening in Ukraine in Bucha and other revelations from the country doesn't look far short of genocide. It follows calls for more rigid sanctions made by the president of Ukraine as he spoke to the Irish parliament today. Vladimir Zelensky says Russia is using hunger as a weapon and is deliberately trying to create a food crisis. I'd like to ask you to convince EU partners to introduce even more rigid sanctions against Russia that would really make sure that the Russian war machine will stop. The only thing is that we are lacking is the principal approach of some leaders, political leaders, business leaders, who still think that war and war crimes is not something as horrific as financial losses. The governor of Ukraine's Luhansk region says buildings are on fire in the area after Russian shelling. While well, the governor's urged residents to get out of the eastern region over concerns that Russian troops are preparing for a new offensive in the Donbass area, which includes Luhansk. In the encircled city of Mariupol, the latest British intelligence reveals heavy fighting and continued Russian airstrikes. Most of the 160,000 remaining residents in the city currently have no light, communication, medicine, heat or water. Russian forces have blocked humanitarian access. Boris Johnson has defended the government's decision to not include trans people in the proposed ban on conversion therapy. Well, the Prime Minister was speaking during a visit to a hospital and he said there were complexities and sensitivities which needed to be worked through. He added he was sad at the reaction of LGBT plus groups who had pulled out of a planned international conference in protest at the decision. Married couples in England and Wales are now able to legally break up without having to attribute blame for the breakdown of their marriage. In the biggest overhaul in the law in half a century, no fault divorce legislation comes into force today. Campaigners say that for families who want to break up amicably, it will help them move forward without conflict. Georgina Chase, the head of family law at Slater and Gordon, told GB News that for many couples, it's the end of the blame game. Um, I understand that for many people they will see that this uh, means that getting divorced is easier, but I think it's not necessarily easier because the law in relation to how to sort the finances and children hasn't changed. What it means is that it's taking that sting out. It's it's making it more accessible. Otherwise, if they've not been uh, separated for two years or more, they're having to rely on the fault-based fact of unreasonable behaviour, um, which of course unnecessarily does unnecessarily creates tension and um, increases hostility. Ed Sheeran has called for the end of baseless claims against songwriters. 
Today, he won a high court battle in a copyright case over his single, Shape of You. Ed Sheeran has insisted he's always tried to be completely fair in crediting people who contribute to his work. While posting on social media after the verdict, the singer said claims like this are too common and they're damaging to the industry. Only so many notes and very few chords used in pop music. Coincidence is bound to happen. Hopefully we can all get back to writing songs rather than having to prove that we can write them. You're up to date on GB News. I'll bring you more as it happens. Now let's head to Alex for We Need to Talk About. Nothing is certain but death and taxes. But what isn't inevitable? A tax rises, especially as the country is being hammered with eye-watering fuel bills, soaring food costs and near double-digit inflation. And even less so under a Tory government that likes to name-check Margaret Thatcher at every turn. Well, today is the day national insurance goes up. For some, this means a couple of hundred pounds a year more. For others, over a thousand, and for the six million small businesses in the UK, a kick in the teeth to the companies and sole traders who got very little support during the pandemic as lockdowns trashed the economy and are now being made to mop up the costs. A tax on jobs to help pay for a government that destroyed jobs with continued lockdowns feels like a sick joke and does little to boost the growth this country vitally needs right now. Well, Liam Halligan, our business and economics editor, is back and has more details on this. Liam, people are facing a significant rise in the cost of living. They are, and this has been a long time in the making, Alex. Even before the Russia-Ukraine conflict, inflation was at a 30-year high. Then, of course, food and fuel prices started to rocket. I've got a graphic here which you just ran in the last hour, Juma, on The Money Show. It's worth looking at. So last Friday, household fuel bills went up by 54% on average as that price cap that was announced in February kicked in. And then we also had council tax bills rise on average on Friday. Uh, today, today, those NICs, those national insurance contributions, they got 1.25 percentage points to 13.25 percent. The threshold, though, where you start paying national insurance, that goes up almost £3,000 to, to £12,500 a year. And that means that earners on £38,000 plus do pay more in national insurance and earners on less than £38,000 a year pay less. But, 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 Alex, and here's a key point, that increase in national insurance, that goes up uh, today, the rate increase. But the increase in the threshold, the bit that allows ministers to say, oh, most people will pay less national insurance, that happens in July. So for the next, yeah, so for the next three months, almost everyone who's working pays more national insurance, rich or poor. Yeah, Joanne, do you think that's the, the right approach? Do you think the government should be taxing us more right now? I mean, we do know that we need to get more money into the NHS and that there's a huge amount of government debt considering some of the crises that have struck us lately. Sure. But is this the correct approach? And I think the problem with politics is there's always another crisis, isn't there? So if you're using that as the basis for... for uh, uh, not cutting taxes or for extending expenditure, then that's uh, unfortunately, as we're seeing at the moment, a sort of constant reality that's with us. I mean, I think this is part of a, of a kind of very disappointing trend that we've seen since Brexit. We were promised some more sort of radical approaches to reforming the UK economy. And all we're getting really are these very sort of technocratic, technocratic sorry, tinkering around the edges. Um, and as you say, nothing that really suggests we're going to see uh, measures to boost growth, uh, to boost productivity. Uh, it, it all feels very, very kind of mealy-mouthed and apologetic in some ways. Yeah, it does. Well, our South East of England reporter Ellie Costello now joins us from Brentwood in Essex, where she's been getting reaction to this. So the heavens have just decided to open here in this staunchly conservative area. This is a place that has always supported the Conservative Party, but this is just another tax. It's not welcome news here at a time when many people are already struggling with household bills, that increase in energy bills. It is a very difficult time for many people here. So I've been speaking to people on the high street about what they make about these national insurance rises in contributions and this is what they told me. I, 
think the national insurance prices were inevitable. They've got to pay for all the money they spent out on COVID. Um, where else are they going to get money for for their friends? I mean, all the contracts that have happened with the NHS that have for faulty goods and things like that, billions of pounds disappeared. Um, they've got to make the income somewhere. It's like the household. You've got to balance the books. Well, there are two ways of looking at it, really. One, that I've been paying national insurance on my working life over 50 years or more, so you can think, well, I've paid my share. But these are different times, and the young people are struggling, and the NHS needs investment as long as the money actually goes to what it's supposed to go to. The country is in total mess. <laughs> I don't know who could come in to make it better, but we need change. Well, that's what people here in Brentwood think, Alex. Lots of agreement that the NHS and social care needs reform, but lots of question about whether this is the right time and the right way to do it. Employees, businesses, they'll all be paying 1.25 pence in every pound, which doesn't sound like a lot, uh, but when that, those pay slips come at the end of the month with all of these other increases in daily living at the moment, that is going to really impact on everything everyday people. Thank you ever so much. Now, of course, you at home can join in the conversation by emailing us gbviews at gbnews.uk. Well, the government says taxes are rising to help tackle the NHS backlog while stressing those on lower incomes will pay less. The Health Secretary, Sajid Javid, spoke to GB News earlier today. You know, we were all benefit uh, from uh, the, the levy, the increased funding and the services that will provide. We will all benefit from that. But in terms of paying for this, it does actually fall on the broader shoulders. The 15 percent highest earners will pay over half the levy. And because of the national insurance tax cut that the Chancellor announced a couple of weeks ago, 70 percent, the 70 percent of workers will be paying less national insurance, including taking account of this levy. Listen to us the well, joining me now is Simon Walls, who's the deputy manager at the St Cecilia's Care Home in Scarborough. Yeah. Simon, what's your reaction to the national insurance increase? Is that worrying you, or do you think it's justified? It's worrying for our staff um, as well as everybody else, and they're being hit just as the recent cuts and the cost in in living. Um, but it's also, we see it as a necessity, but we never asked for it to be a national insurance rise. We asked for the government to reform social care and throwing money at something doesn't make it. Understand they're gonna need an improvement in, in funding, etc. But I don't know whether taxes would be a fair reversion because the higher the earning, the more the tax. And it is affecting, unfortunately, everybody across the board three months difference from when they start the national insurance rise to when this uh, levy comes in for people that aren't earning as much and it's just it just seems generally unfair and it's it is going to nhs it's not going to social care at this time yeah, Simon, thank you ever so much for joining me on the programme. We've got we had a few little hiccups with your connection there. Your audio is not perfect, so we're going to have to leave it there. That was Simon Walls. Well, Joanne, I'll come back to you on this one. I mean, without a doubt, when you look at how long it takes to get a GP appointment, the backlog in hospitals, the NHS is on its knees. I mean, we're told this every single year, practically, but it really is, and the money had to come from somewhere. Well, I mean, I think you put, you know, hit the nail on the head in your introduction by uh, by intimating that, you know, there have been some big policy decisions taken over the last two years that involved huge amounts of spending um, and perhaps had had the lockdowns not continued as long as they did. Uh, we'd be looking at, you know, a, a better sort of uh, state of uh, the exchequer in general. But also on this issue of social care, you know, the guests that we just heard from, um, as he quite rightly said, you know, this is adult social care and, and, uh, and this kind of care has been long promised uh, for reform by the government. The government, to give them credit, uh, have decided to, to look at that in a way that I think previous governments have shied away from. But they've still tried to protect uh, wealth held in housing and in homes. And I think, you know, they're, they're afraid, it seems to me, of, of facing up to the fact that a lot of people do save in the context of their homes. And perhaps they're doing that with a conservative mindset, that that's where the safest place for them to keep their wealth is during their lifetimes. And they may well 
have to accept the reality that you can't have the right to hold on to that home if you're going into if you're going into a care setting. Yeah, well, this is the real rub of it, isn't it? Because, you know, national insurance affects working aged people. It is a tax on jobs. And yet those people who are probably the biggest burden on the health service are those people who have got to the stage that they probably own their houses outright, while younger people are really struggling to get on the housing ladder. Do you think, you, you know, it's possible to be a bit cynical about this and to say, well, the Conservatives always pander to older voters because they're more likely to turn out at the ballot box? Well, I mean, I, I do think that's probably an element of it. We are talking about then, you know, the natural voter base of the Conservative Party. But I think it's short-sighted because, it, as you say, it, it doesn't address the sort of generational disparities that have become, you know, ever really more entrenched with this, you know, crazy inflation of house prices. And, and given that that inflation has happened and, and it's been fueled by all sorts of aspects of policy, not least the lack of a proper monetary policy, um, you know, we now have a lot of people who do hold wealth in their homes. And it seems curious to me that they're being, uh, you know, enabled to continue to do that through a policy that's supposed to be more, um, uh, you know, to, to spread, to spread the, uh, uh, the benefits of that more widely. Joanne, thank you ever so much. You can join in, of course, GB Views at gbnews.uk. You are with GB News on TV and radio. It's time for a short break now and a check on the weather forecast. Hello again, I'm Aidan McGiven from the Met Office. Bright spells for many today, but there will be a lot of heavy showers around and some more persistent wet weather affecting the far north of Scotland, in particular Orkney. That's where an occluded front is lingering through the rest of the day. Low pressure sitting out to the west of Scotland, bringing this blustery and unstable westerly airflow in. A spell of rain clearing the far southeast as we head into the afternoon, but further Fairly heavy showers following and these will be lively with hail and gusty winds associated with them. Otherwise, a mixture of bright spells and showers for many. There will be some sunny spells at times, but in the north of Scotland and for parts of western Scotland, some more persistent rain, especially Orkney, and it will feel cold in the Northern Isles, milder elsewhere, but an increasing wind through the day. In fact, that wind reaching gale force in the north of Scotland and then those gales pushing into Northern Ireland and parts of the Irish Sea coast with northwest England, North Wales seeing gusts of 60, perhaps more miles an hour. Some persistent rain running along the south coast of England. In between, there'll be some uh, clear spells overnight, but colder air is spreading south, some icy patches for the north of Scotland, and some hill snow as we wake up on Thursday. And that spell of hill snow pushes into parts of northern England as well. Turns showery through the day on Thursday, so a mixture of rain and hail at lower levels, snow showers over hills. And then in the far south, any early rain clears, some sunny spells here, 12 degrees. 8 degrees for Manchester, feeling cold in the wind further north across Scotland and Northern Ireland, although there will be some bright weather around and some sunny spells here and there away from the showers. Showers spill south during Thursday evening. Clear spells follow. Again, hill snow affecting parts of Scotland, Northern England, North Wales as well, where we see those showers come and go. A frosty night on Friday into Saturday. It's going to be a fairly bright weekend for many, but there will be a chill in the mornings. Europe is in the grip of the most devastating humanitarian crisis since World War II. The people of Ukraine are facing unimaginable suffering. As their homes are destroyed and their loved ones are killed. Millions of people are being forced to flee for their lives, carrying only their children, their pets and the clothes on their back. The pain, loss and destruction grows by the day. The people of Ukraine urgently need our help. Already a vast humanitarian operation is underway. Britain's Disasters Emergency Committee, or DEC, brings together 15 leading aid charities to respond to overseas disasters quickly and efficiently. These charities include the British Red Cross, CARE, Oxfam, Save the Children and World Vision. Their teams are working on the ground in Ukraine and neighbouring countries to bring vital aid to those who need it most. If you can spare it, your gift to the DEC's humanitarian appeal will go a really long way. £10 provides essential hygiene supplies for a person for a month. £50 provides blankets for four families. £100 provides emergency food for two families per month. 
It's easy to give. You can donate online at dec.org.uk or call the 24-hour donation line on 0370 60 60 900. If you prefer to send a cheque, please post it to the Ukraine Humanitarian Appeal, PO Box 999, London, EC 3A 3AA. To give £10 on your mobile, simply text the word CRISIS to 70150. Standard network charges apply for calls and you must be 16 or over. Texts are charged at the standard network rate and your £10 donation will be added to your bill. 100% of your donation goes directly to the DEC to save lives and deliver critical support where it's needed. Welcome back. For lots of people who have gone through divorce, it's often the messiest, most acrimonious, expensive and brutal experience of their lives. The tug of war over houses, savings, stuff, pets and kids as a shared life is sawn in two, adding salt to the wounds of a breakup. Broken hearts and broken homes with a lawyer's bill Brilliant. to okay. break the bank. Fantastic. OK, thank you. Well, today, no-fault divorces come into play, which means couples who simply want to go their separate ways can agree to split yeah, without having fine, to perfect. play the Thanks. blame game by proving adultery, unreasonable behaviour or desertion by dredging the past for bad behaviour. But what it doesn't do is help to divide the assets, and it also means one partner can simply file for divorce without reason. Is that not making a mockery of the sanctity of marriage by making it disgustingly disposable? What's the point of taking vows that can be trashed with such ease? Well, I'm going to speak to Joanne on this one first. Joanne, I mean, a lot of people welcoming this, saying that if, you know, it's been 50 years that divorce has been around, and frankly, it's ridiculous that you've got to prove some of these pretty horrible reasons and dredge up traumas in able to get one. Yes, I mean, it feels like a very sort of transactional type of a reform. And as you say, a lot of people have been campaigning for it for a long time. And I can see that it could be very effective in helping those couples, uh, which, and I don't know how many of these couples there are, but where you have two people who've mutually decided that they want to go their separate ways, that they are genuinely amicable about it, and not just using that term as a way of, uh, of, of PRing their experience, um, then you could well argue, well, you know, why does the state need to be involved uh, in any sort of further recriminations between those couples? Uh, but I, I do, you know, actually slightly worry about this because, as you say, I mean, we have a very bizarre culture, it strikes me, in this country where people spend thousands of pounds on uh, kind of romanticised uh, weddings. And yet uh, the, a very high number of, of marriages do end in divorce. So somehow we're not really valuing marriage properly. Uh, we're building up people's expectations, it seems to me, that uh, they're going to be, you know, permanently happy and in a state of bliss once they've got married. And that when they don't find that that's the case, they can kind of easily slip out of commitments which, you know, almost very often involve children. And it's really the welfare of children that we should be putting first and foremost. Yeah, indeed. Well, I'm joined by Matt O'Connor, the founding member of Fathers for Justice, a group which campaigns for, for a fatherless society. Now, Matt, you have a few reservations about the, the sort of quickie divorces as well, I think on similar grounds to what Joanne was just saying there. Yeah, I mean, similar-ish. I mean, our issue, Alex, is that the no-fault divorce laws won't really change a huge amount apart from remove many men uh, from their children, from their homes, and from their assets quicker than ever. The, all the outdated sexist notions of uh, divorce remain. The assumption, this, this prehistoric assumption, that children live with the mother, and therefore you know, the mother and the children live in the same house, uh, and all these ridiculous notions. And what no-fault divorce is, you know, is manifestly misrepresenting. It says it's going to remove the blame game. Like Sam has been wonderful panacea, you know, everybody's going to, there's going to be, you know, uh, rainbows over the royal courts of justice, unicorns running down the strand. It is a nonsense because what will happen is the problem, particularly if you're married and you have children, the problem is simply displaced into the family court system, which is broken, which is secretive, which doesn't have enough judges at the moment. They're literally digging family court judges up out the graveyard. The problems are simply displaced. 
And um, for us, this is the problem here, is we need genuine, meaningful reform. We need divorce equality for men and women. We need parental equality for dads. We need to change the notion that women, that <laughs> mothers, a chain to the sink at home with their kids. Let's plug fathers back into families and get better outcomes for our children, uh, our parents and, and our country, most importantly. Does it worry you that uh, with the, the, the new sort of uh, no blame divorces, no fault divorces, just one party can go and ask for a divorce and doesn't have to have a reason for doing that? Does it worry you that there could be situations in families where rather than the couple almost being forced to work on their marriage, to really, mm. you know, take steps, whether it be seeking counselling or, you know, whatever it may be to try and hold the household together, it will become way too easy for just one parent to say, I'm done with this. I'm off, and it gets wrapped up pretty quickly. Well, it makes a mockery of our idea of marriage, doesn't it? That you can, uh, it's what I call marriage, the fraud of the rings. Uh, you know, you've got the engagement ring, the wedding ring, and the supper ring. And the point is, as soon as somebody thinks the grass is greener on the other side, right, they're going to leave that uh, marriage, that commitment, that commitment you make. Many people still make that commitment in church. It's meant to be a lifelong commitment, but we undermine it. The Church of England, who sells you marriage, you know, the, the, the institution of marriage, you know, they don't provide you with any, you know, off you go down the M1 in your little car, marriage car, wedding, just married, looks fantastic. But when you break down, when there's a relationship breakdown, there's no after sales service. There's no roadside recovery. There's no support for you. And the idea that we can just walk away from marriage as a sort of transactional deal that you'd have had uh, with some retailer, it just makes a mockery of it, Alex. And, you know, I, I, I take a view, having been married twice uh, and, and been that stupid, um, you know, that I think men particularly, when they're looking at getting married and we're conditioned to think, that marriage is this panacea, lifelong happiness. I mean, men in particular need to look at what that contract means and the onerous responsibilities and the punitive nature of that. If you're a man, they need to step back on that because there is a deadly divorce trap. The deadly divorce trap is that if you get divorced as a man, you're three times more likely to take your own life. 70% of separated men live in poverty. You're going to end up in a bed sit. You're going to end up in a shared accommodation. The outcomes of men are pretty bad. And so I think we need to have a proper open debate about all the issues here and say, not this tinkering around with divorce. We need genuine, meaningful reform, divorce equality and parental equality. Why can't dads have the same rights as mothers? And as Gloria Steinman said, the American feminist, women can't be equal outside the home until men are equal inside the home. Matt O'Connor from Fathers to Justice. It's been great talking to you on this subject. Now, quickly, I'm going to come back to you on this one because what you were saying earlier about the fairy tale wedding and throwing thousands of pounds into it, do you think socially we're now in a position where we're so consumerist and everything's so disposable that you know, even marriages are throwaway and that we're not doing enough as a society to say to people it's good and it's healthy to get together and work to stay together? Yes, I think that's probably right. I mean, uh, I remember David Cameron when he was campaigning to be leader, and I think even when he was prime minister, talked about introducing reforms which would obligate um, couples who were considering divorce to go through some kind of um, counselling process. Um, I'm, I'm not aware that that actually is in any way required of divorcing couples. I think that there was a sort of conflation between um, counselling um, and a sort of a collaborative process in terms of how you uh, get rid of your or how you share out your, your assets. And, and that process is not quite the same as counselling because it presupposes that you're both mutually committed to the divorce. So, I mean, I, I think that there are very good reasons for reforming divorce, uh, but I'd be very concerned if people can't now um, register some genuine objection along the lines that you were saying it perhaps gives too much power to one party to end a marriage. Although, let's face it, the reality is that it takes two people to walk down an aisle, but it only takes one of them to depart from that. Yeah, very nicely put. You're with GB News on TV and DAB Radio. Coming up, what's NATO's next move to stop Putin? I'll be joined by military intelligence experts, plus a celebrity chef on why having to put calorie counts on menus is like a dog's dinner. 
Now it's time for a check on the news headlines. Good afternoon, it's 2.31. I'm Rosie Wright, here to keep you up to date. The Prime Minister says today's 1.25% rise in national insurance is unquestionably the right thing to do for our country and the NHS. Britain's tax burden has now risen to its highest point in 70 years. The government says £39 billion will be raised over the next three years, helping to reduce the NHS backlog. Well, Boris Johnson says what's happening in Ukraine in Bucha and some of the other revelations from Ukraine, that doesn't look far short of genocide. It follows calls for more rigid sanctions made by the president of Ukraine as he spoke earlier today to the Irish parliament. Volodymyr Zelensky says Russia is using hunger as a weapon and is deliberately creating a food crisis. Pope Francis has condemned what he's described as the massacre of Bucha. Holding up the Ukrainian flag, he said, had been sent to him from the town. Recent footage from there has shown images of tied bodies, a mass grave and other signs of executions. In the UK, the Prime Minister has defended the government's decision to not include trans people in the proposed ban on conversion therapy. Speaking during a hospital visit, Boris Johnson said there were complexities and sensitivities which needed to be worked through. Well, Covid case rates in England are at the highest they've ever been. Researchers from Imperial College London say a rising prevalence in the infection in older adults may increase hospitalisations and deaths despite high levels of vaccination. Ed Sheeran has called for the end of baseless claims against songwriters after winning a high court battle in the copyright case of his song, Shape of You. Well, he posted on social media after the verdict and said claims like this are too common and they're damaging the industry. Sheeran and his Shape of You co-writers denied copying parts of the 2015 song, Oh Why, by Sammy Chokri, after Chokri claimed the tracks were strikingly similar. You're up to date on GB News, but on your TV, online and radio. Shortly, we'll be back to Alex. Europe is in the grip of the most devastating humanitarian crisis since World War II. The people of Ukraine are facing unimaginable suffering. As their homes are destroyed and their loved ones are killed. Millions of people are being forced to flee for their lives, carrying only their children, their pets and the clothes on their back. The pain, loss and destruction grows by the day. The people of Ukraine urgently need our help. Already a vast humanitarian operation is underway. Britain's Disasters Emergency Committee, or DEC, brings together 15 leading aid charities to respond to overseas disasters quickly and efficiently. These charities include the British Red Cross, CARE, Oxfam, Save the Children and World Vision. Their teams are working on the ground in Ukraine and neighbouring countries to bring vital aid to those who need it most. If you can spare it, your gift to the DEC's humanitarian appeal will go a really long way. £10 provides essential hygiene supplies for a person for a month. £50 provides blankets for four families. £100 provides emergency food for two families per month. It's easy to give. You can donate online at dec.org.uk or call the 24-hour donation line on 0370 60 60 900. If you prefer to send a cheque, please post it to the Ukraine Humanitarian Appeal, PO Box 999, London, EC 3A 3AA. To give £10 on your mobile, simply text the word CRISIS to 70 150. Standard network charges apply for calls and you must be 16 or over. Texts are charged at the standard network rate and your £10 donation will be added to your bill. 100% of your donation goes directly to the DEC to save lives and deliver critical support where it's needed. Yesterday, I asked what the point of the UN was when it's so tragically toothless against Putin. How hypocritical many countries are talking the talk but not walking the walk when it comes to cutting Russia out. Turns out I'm not the only one who finds the entire thing revolting. President Zelensky told the UN directly quite how useless they are being. 
and again today. The drip drip of more sanctions promises from the EU as Ursula von der Leyen pledges to now blacklist coal and ships and push for a block on Russian oil. While the worst offender is Germany, heartlessly clinging to Kremlin ties. Let's not forget, though, that this is the same von der Leyen who was the German defence secretary accused of running their armed forces into the ground while being embroiled in various procurement scandals. Well, it's also emerged that Germany continuously broke EU sanctions to sell things to Russia that could be used to make weapons. What did she personally sign off? Has anyone even asked? Well, it's just as well the UK has turned to Australia and America to shore up Western defences with hypersonic missiles. It often takes a crisis to find out who your real friends are. Well, just a few moments ago, the Secretary General of NATO, Jens Stoltenberg, spoke in Brussels. We have all seen the atrocities uh, that have been committed in Buja and uh, uh, other places in Ukraine. Uh, this reveals the true nature of uh, President uh, Putin's war. Uh, any targeting and killing of uh, civilians uh, is a war crime, and uh, therefore NATO uh, allies uh, are supporting the international efforts to establish all the facts, uh, to investigate and uh, to make sure that uh, uh, perpetrators are uh, punished. Well, joining me now on the show is former senior military intelligence officer and NATO planner, Philip Ingram. Philip, it's great to have you back on the show. I mean, we do really need to look at NATO now and what more can be done perhaps militarily, if not directly, given, I would say, the feebleness of the EU. To put it in context, it's since the war began, the EU's given a million euros to Ukraine and 35 million to Russia for energy. So frankly, it doesn't look like those sanctions are up to much at all. So how can NATO now progress things to really put Putin back in his box? Well, I, Alex, I think we're starting to see it. You know, the Czechs have started to send tanks and other infantry fighting vehicles um, uh, to Ukraine. And there are certain NATO members that have got the sorts of vehicles and weapon systems that the Ukrainians are used to operating. We can't give them stuff that they're not used to operating. It takes months to train crews to operate them. It takes years to train technicians to keep them going. Um, and therefore, uh, it's, it's important that we then provide the uh, backup equipment to backfill what other countries are going to give. Uh, and the Czechs have started to lead the way. I think we'll start to see the same coming out of other nations. Uh, and we're starting to see other um, useful equipment coming in. You know, the UK has just supplied the Star Streak um, anti-aircraft missile, um, as well as more javelins and more um, NLAW um, uh, anti-tank weapons coming from UK and US. The Australians have just sent uh, a lot of Bushmaster armoured wheeled vehicles that will allow uh, people to get around the battlefield uh, in a much more protected way. So the, the amount of military aid that's going in is ramping up. But there is still this concern, isn't there, that the more we do, the more it raises the risk of potential escalation by Putin to turn this into a far larger continental conflagration. Do you think that's true or do you think we're pussyfooting around him? I, th I think it's a bit of both. Um, you know, Putin is a bully. And the best way to deal with a bully is to punch him hard. Um, the difficulty is he's a bully with nuclear weapons. And, they, and this is where it's very easy to criticize our leaders. There are three leaders in the world that have to make the, the final decision on this. And that's Joe Biden, Boris Johnson and Francois Macron, because they're the three nuclear nations in, um, uh, in NATO. Uh, and you know, Putin has already threatened with his nuclear stick. Um, he could easily go further if we push him too hard. And at the moment, the conflict is within the geographic boundaries of Ukraine. Uh, and we've got tens of thousands of people dying, millions of people being displaced. If that breaks out of that, Putin still has the ability to go and invade other places with, his con with some conventional forces, but also with his rocket forces, and then uh, escalate nuclear. And we could then see that tens of thousands turning into hundreds of thousands across Europe dead, and that millions displaced turning into tens of millions being displaced across Europe. It's a very dangerous game, and our politicians have got you know, a, a, an impossible task to try and work out what's right. I mean, three politicians who might be trying to uh, at least increase our own weapons stock in the West are Scott Morrison, Joe Biden and Boris Johnson through AUKUS. That's Australia, the UK and the United States. And they've just announced, haven't they, that we're going to be developing hypersonic missiles? 
Yeah, they, they have. There's there's a lot of uh, a lot of hype around hypersonic missiles. The Russians have got uh, a capability, which is it's a hypersonic glide missile. The Russians and the Chinese have got it, um, and people are, are scared about it because it evades our defences. Well, most normal missiles will evade our defences anyway. We've got hypersonic missiles. It's called the Trident D5 intercontinental ballistic missile that goes through a hypersonic range and um, what what this is is the development of a, a new weapon that uh, will counter um, other sophisticated air defense means the the russians don't have many of them uh, there's you know, because of the word hype and it being new and all the rest of it there's an awful lot of incorrect reporting about you know, its military utility. It's not really going to affect what's happening inside Ukraine. There's a lot more that we can give the Ukrainians, for example, that um, will counter the Russian threats from their conventional weapons. It's, it's their more conventional weapons that are causing more damage than their hypersonic missiles. Now, going back to NATO, I mean, if there's one thing this conflict has exposed, it's how duplicitous some of the countries have been. As I was talking earlier of the EU's payments to Russia for energy, and particularly Germany, who at the outbreak of this war was actually stopping other NATO members sending things uh, to Ukraine to support them, and indeed stopping British supplies being flown over their airspace. Are countries like Germany now bogging NATO down? Well, there's always been differences between different countries. You know, I, I remember doing some NATO planning into the Balkans beforehand, where um, a NATO member um, was given a particular area. They didn't like one of the tasks in the particular area, so whenever they came to back brief their plan to deal with it, they just ignored it completely because their government had said no. NATO's used to dealing with those sorts of things, and that plays the strengths of each of the nations. Each nation brings something slightly different, and the NATO planners are used to using the strengths of different nations uh, and trying to reinforce the weaknesses of, of other nations. And it's that balance of the different capabilities uh, and, the, and the different political thinkings and everything else that means that NATO is as strong as it is. Philip, it's always brilliant having you on the show and getting your insights. Really, really valuable. Philip Ingram there. Well, Joanne, I'm going to come to you on this. I mean, I've just been appalled, frankly. When that statistic, a million, a million, a, a, a billion euros to yeah. Ukraine, and 35. 35 billion to <laughs> Russia from the EU. I mean, yeah. what... It's, it's really, really um, depressing, isn't it, and, and horrendous in terms of its implications. Uh, but I was very interested in what your specialist was saying about this issue of backfilling. So, in other words, what NATO can do is effectively replace uh, resources um, to countries like Czechoslovakia or, or the, sorry, the, the Czech Repub Republic, rather, and to Poland, who are uh, making supplies of, uh, of, of uh, other armaments. Um, and, uh, and sort of equipment that actually uh, the Ukrainians know how to use. Were it to come straight from NATO countries, they may not have the expertise to, to use it. So as much as we might think that um, notwithstanding the implications for specific NATO involvement, uh, even if that were possible, um, it might just be supplying uh, weaponry that the Ukrainians aren't equipped to use. So this idea that we backfill from other countries, I think we really need to do more in that area and go back to Joe Biden, because if you remember some weeks ago now, uh, there was talk about supplying jets to Poland and then that was pulled at the last minute. Yeah, couldn't agree more. Well, if this war has exposed one thing, it's quite how dependent Europe has been on Putin's gas. Fracking is one of the most demonised practices in the UK, with hysterical swampies peddling loony conspiracies about earthquakes, flammable water and cancer. Well, thank you, eco-zealots, because now we're in a situation where Putin can play games with fuel prices while murdering Ukrainians as we go cap in hand to the Middle Eastern tyrants for help, despite sitting on 13,000 trillion cubic feet of shale gas in northern England alone. All those communities destroyed when mines were closed, we could have fracked. All that diplomatic leverage against merciless regimes, we could have fracked. All those tax hikes to stop runaway debt, we could have fracked. We could have fracked so hard and so long that we could have sold our lovely light gas to our neighbours, spoiling Putin's despotic plans while filling up the national coffers. We could even have pumped some of that cash back into green energy. But no. We left our diet gas underground and imported full-fat fossil fuels instead. Finally, though, it seems the government have thought twice about concreting over the wells. Better late than never, I guess. It's high time we hurried the frack up. 
Joining me now in the studio is policy manager of UK onshore oil and gas and fracking expert, Charles McAllister. Charles, fantastic to have you here. You. I've been pushing for fracking for ages, not because I'm a big fan of, uh, you know, trying to mess up climate change, but it's been obvious to me anyway that this would be a huge help to be able to transition away from fossil fuels and, and very clear that important for national security. Absolutely. I mean, I always say to people, the case for shale gas in the UK is in one word, logical. Look at the demand, look at the shortfall out to 2050, potentially a trillion pounds we would have to send overseas to countries that you've named in the absence of increases in production. Potential tax take, 200 billion compared to what we've seen in the North Sea, energy security, jobs levelling up the UK, what's not to like? What is not to like? Well, people say that, you know, fracking is hideous for the environment, it causes earthquakes, it puts poisons in the water table. Can you myth bust some of those things? 100%. Uh, so let's go seismicity first. So the moratorium was allegedly based on um, a report done in the Preston New Road 1Z well in Lancashire. The largest event of that well was a 1.5 on the Richter scale, which is the equivalent of me dropping a honeydew melon onto the ground here. Um, even if we look at the larger event, the 2.9, that is um, the surface vibration from that is uh, half what, was, what is permitted at construction sites. I walk past four construction sites on my way to this studio. In terms of water contamination, what I always say is, what part of the regulations do people think are so weak that they allow the facilitation of that? I've never had a good answer to that. Now, what is the difference as well between shale gas yep. and natural gas? And, and, and is one lighter than the other? Because my understanding is shale gas is a bit like diet gas. So shale gas is natural gas. It's isotopically identical to, to the gas that we would get out of the North Sea. Shale is a source rock. It's unconventional. The source of all oil and gas really is shale. And then in some regions that breaks up and then goes into conventional formations. Good way to describe it is conventional is like a jam donut. Um, you drill down in and then you suck the jam out. Shale is like tiramisu, you drill down, you drill across, and then you hydraulically fracture that to improve recovery. And so why do you think it is? I mean, is it just all about climate change that government has sat on this for so long? I mean, I remember when Theresa May first became Prime Minister, she did a big old speech about fracking. What happened? I mean, I, I don't know. I think our arguments on the compatibility of shale gas with net zero are very, very strong. The carbon intensity of liquefied natural gas, which we're importing in vast volume at the minute, at the point of delivery is four times that of shale gas. So if we don't develop shale, our energy supply carbon footprint goes through the roof. And this is not a, you know, renewables or shale debate. I'm getting really irritated by this sort of black and white thinking. We need, you know, a shade of grey here. Not 50 shades of grey, but at least some sort of shade of grey. Now, just briefly, because I've got to wind up this soon, um, how much shale gas have we got and could we start exporting it all over the place and getting rich? OK, so um, based on the report done by the British, British Geological Survey, there's about 37.6 trillion cubic metres. Now, down there, that's what's down there. We think we can get about 10% of that out. It's 3,760 billion cubic metres in English. At today's prices, that's between two and three trillion pounds worth Ooh. of natural gas, so more than UK GDP. There you go. Pensions for everyone forever. Absolutely. Charles, it's been fantastic having you on, and thank you so much Thanks. for myth busting. And let's hope we start fracking again for all of us. Let's hope so. Now, let's move on to something else. I'm going to let you in to a secret. I'm a reformed chubster. Oh, yes, lockdown helped change me from bon viveur into health bore. I cut the carbs. Cut the calories and cut my cuddliness, shedding two stone in a matter of months. And you know what? It was far easier than I ever thought it would be. And it's actually been quite simple to maintain. So when it comes to calories on menus, well, I'm in. Having had my Damascene conversion on diet, I can see the logic in knowing what you're putting into your cake hole. Oh, I've become a bit of a low carbifarian evangelist. But loads of us struggle with weight and the government is keen to do something about it. So today, restaurants will have to tell diners how many calories are in their meals. But many think it's the nanny state in overdrive. Others worry it will trigger people with eating disorders while restaurants now face a whole load of red tape just to change the daily specials. With joining me today to discuss this is award-winning chef and restaurateur Aldo Zilli. Aldo, now I know you are quite a, a bit of a health fanatic as well, but what's it like having to calculate calories and put that on your menus? I want to look like you. What have you done? <laughs> Two stone lighter, eh? God. Yeah. That, that, and that didn't take you very long either. 
So it does work if you if you look after yourself. I mean, carbs is is a big thing, isn't it? Sugar, intake of sugar. So now menus have to have all of that, all the counts. When you go to a restaurant nowadays, you have to be um, able to get the menu and see what you're eating. It will put some people off. Uh, the big chains will have to do it straight away. Uh, over 200 staff. People like us, we're still small here in Lucarelli. We're not, we're not uh, targeted yet, but we're preparing for it because I'm sure that it's going to go all the way down the line. The government always starts uh, with something like this and then it filters all the way down to small cafes and everyone. Uh, the, my opinion on this is, um, yes, it's a good idea. It was coming 20 years ago when I had restaurants in London and uh, it never did come because um, it, they thought that probably it wasn't a, a great idea in those days. Now, with all these chains of restaurants, maybe, you know, it is a good idea and people will want to see what they're putting in calorie-wise when they go and eat in restaurants. But at the same time, it's going to create uh, extra work for chefs. I mean, as chefs are creators, we are artists. We love cooking. We love doing things. And, um, you know, we love seasons. So it kind of restricts us a little bit when we come to create new dishes. And how, how do you go about calculating the calories in a meal? Because it's actually not that easy. I've tried doing it myself. I cook a lot of my own food. And so you find yourself going, well, this is how many calories is in this particular amount of eggs and this particular amount of this vegetable and that quantity of meat. But, you know, when you're cooking loads and loads of meals and especially sort of nice luxury ones that people want to treat themselves to when going out for dinner, it must take some sort of enigma code breaker to come up with the final figure. Well, the final figure will be online, obviously, because we, we are not, um, um, you know, we're not dietitians. We're going, we are chefs, so we're going to rely on uh, what's going to be on the internet and we're going to put the recipes in and hopefully we'll come back with the, the calorie count. But, you know, those, those things are now going to be available, uh, I'm sure, from tomorrow uh, to uh, the chefs that are involved in doing this. I, for one... You know, I'm writing a new cookery book. God forbid, it's not the same as it was writing a cookery book 20 years ago, you know, 30 years ago when I wrote my first one. It's very, very difficult. It's very difficult because you have to tell people everything, which is not, we're not, we're not, I'm not saying we've been lying or we've been um, keeping things back from people, but the government also needs to look at schools. You know, we've got problems with schools. Uh, you know, the, that's where it all starts, because we don't, we don't, we're not born fat or thin. We just are, are accustomed, and what we eat and what we drink is as we live. And it's our parents, you know, your parents, what they cook for you, how they're feeding you. And then, of course, you go to restaurants like this one, where I am here, for example, and then, you know, you've got this on the, menu, on the, on the table. You've got extra virgin olive oil. So people go, Zhh! And that's it. That's another 200 calories on your on your meal. You know, we can't control everything. Yeah, no, indeed. Aldo, it's always fabulous talking, Jim. When I come and dine with you, don't worry. I won't care how many calories I eat. It'll be my special night out. Aldo Zilli there, who's an award-winning chef. Now, Joanne, what, what's your view on this? Is it misery? Is it red tape? Is it nanny state? Or is it the fact that we're getting fat as a society and perhaps people do need to count calories? I, I actually think it's all of those things, which is <laughs> slightly sitting on the fence. But actually, from a consumer's point of view, I think it's not a bad idea. I think, you know, the more information available to consumers, the better. But I don't run a restaurant. And if I did, um, given that uh, all the other things we've been discussing this hour about added tax increases and all the rest of it, I think, you know, it could be an unwelcome burden. And frankly, uh, if you're talking about trying to improve the health of the nation, most people do not eat most of their meals in restaurants. Um, so, you know, uh, you need to really sort of factor this into all the other places that we eat and all the other things that we eat and all those decisions that people make as to how much exercise they take, for instance. So this is really, I think, only, you know, touching the sides of this issue. Joanne, thank you so much. And thank you as well, Charles, for your brilliant explainer on fracking. It's been a fantastic oh. programme today. I've certainly enjoyed myself. That's all I've got time for, though. But you can join me again for We Need to Talk About on GB News at the same time, same place, 2 o'clock tomorrow. Coming up next, of course, it's The Briefing with Darren McAfee. But first, let's have a little look at the weather forecast. Bye-bye.
Hello again, I'm Aidan McGiven from the Met Office. Bright spells for many today, but there will be a lot of heavy showers around and some more persistent wet weather affecting the far north of Scotland, in particular Orkney. That's where an occluded front is lingering through the rest of the day. Low pressure sitting out to the west of Scotland, bringing this blustery and unstable westerly airflow in. A spell of rain clearing the far southeast as we head into the afternoon, but further Fairly heavy showers following and these will be lively with hail and gusty winds associated with them. Otherwise a mixture of bright spells and showers for many. There will be some sunny spells at times but in the north of Scotland and for parts of western Scotland some more persistent rain, especially Orkney and it will feel cold in the Northern Isles, milder elsewhere but an increasing wind through the day. In fact that wind reaching gale force in the north of Scotland and then those gales pushing into Northern Ireland and parts of the Irish Sea coast with northwest England, North Wales seeing gusts of 60, perhaps more miles an hour. Some persistent rain running along the south coast of England. In between there'll be some uh, clear spells overnight but colder air is spreading south, some icy patches for the north of Scotland and some hill snow as we wake up on Thursday and that spell of hill snow pushes into parts of northern England as well. Turns showery through the day on Thursday so a mixture of rain and hail at lower levels, snow showers over hills and then in the far south any early rain clears, some sunny spells here, 12 degrees, 8 degrees for Manchester, feeling cold in the wind further north across Scotland and Northern Ireland, although there will be some bright weather around and some sunny spells here and there away from the showers. Showers spill south during Thursday evening. Clear spells follow. Again, hill snow affecting parts of Scotland, Northern England, North Wales as well, where we see those showers come and go. A frosty night on Friday into Saturday. It's going to be a fairly bright weekend for many, but there will be a chill in the mornings. Europe is in the grip of the most devastating humanitarian crisis since World War II. The people of Ukraine are facing unimaginable suffering. As their homes are destroyed and their loved ones are killed. Millions of people are being forced to flee for their lives, carrying only their children, their pets and the clothes on their back. The pain, loss and destruction grows by the day. The people of Ukraine urgently need our help. Already a vast humanitarian operation is underway. Britain's Disasters Emergency Committee, or DEC, brings together 15 leading aid charities to respond to overseas disasters quickly and efficiently. These charities include the British Red Cross, CARE, Oxfam, Save the Children,